Okay, well, um, first of all, thanks very much for coming and, and, um, and apologies for my voice. Um, I usually pro project quite well, but uh, I'm on the end of a cold now and my voice is uh, suffering a bit. So um, if I take copious drinks of my wine, then um, hopefully we'll get to the end of this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, marine aliens. Um, and this is kind of in some ways a, a, a sort of side venture for myself and something that I've kind of uh, fallen into um, uh, over the past 10 years, really, um, for a variety of reasons, which might become apparent during my talk. Um, so, the, the, the term marine aliens, alien species, is, you know, sounds quite exotic. Um, what, what do we actually mean by marine aliens? Um, well, in terms of alien species, we can um, consider a number of terms, non-native, exotic, non-indigenous. They all mean the same thing. Um, essentially, a species is occurring where it shouldn't occur. Um, a species has been introduced by human action outside its natural past or present distribution. So the critical thing is that humans have, by their activities, have moved a species from one part of the planet to another part of the planet. Um, we're not talking here about, let's say, uh, uh, range extensions of species through, for example, changing climate. We're talking about uh, human vectors, uh, transport mechanisms that uh, humans are, are using, could be shipping, could be aircraft, um, that have moved uh, organisms around the planet. And they occur in the terrestrial environment, freshwater environment. Here I'm obviously focusing on the marine environment. You'll also come across another term, the term invasive. So we can talk about invasive alien species or invasive non-native species. Um, and the invasive bit essentially means that the species that has been introduced and it, it, by doing so, it threatens local biological diversity or is having some kind of unforeseen impact. And that could be, could be an economic impact. And generally, species that, have, that are non-native, that are alien, and that we then call invasive, are invasive because essentially they've proliferated and become super abundant and are having some kind of impact. Now, often in the terrestrial environment, and even sometimes freshwater environment, it, it's very obvious when species um, that are non-native are invasive. You can see them everywhere. Um, in the marine environment, often they go unseen. And in terms of whether a non-native species, an alien species, um, is invasive, is, is often based on, on, on guesswork, essentially. There's not a great deal of research to understand that. Now, in terms of thinking locally, if we, if we do a Google search for um, non-native species in Britain and Ireland and, and click on images, we'll get something like that. Um, we'll get mink, rabbit, uh, parakeet, uh, even wallabies. So lots of very obvious terrestrial species. Um, some birds, and what's that? I don't know, I'm not a bird person. What's that? <laughs> Some kind of turn, there we go. Okay, um, we, will, we will find some barnacles and a crab there, so we're getting a little bit marine. But essentially, very often, um, if we're not marine specific, when we think of non-native species, we think terrestrial. We have to think about the marine environment specifically um, and maybe ask the question, okay, so how many non-native species occur around Britain and Ireland? Is it one, ten, 100,000? Well, for that, we, we, we turn to the academic literature. So here's a paper, um, a research paper in a publication called Aquatic Invasions. Um, and it's about alien species in British brackish and marine waters. So brackish meaning um, estuarine, essentially. Um, and in the paper, they acknowledge that providing a full list of alien species is acknowledged to be extremely difficult in the marine environment because often out of sight, out of mind, you need to go out there and look very carefully. But even when you do, um, the, the taxonomic expertise to understand whether that particular very tiny little organism is actually native to Brit Britain and Ireland or has been transported from some other part of the world uh, is quite difficult. And don't forget, we tend to think of um, alien species as being a very modern phenomenon 
but we've been moving around the planet for a few hundred years. And very often, some of the, the most obvious non-native species um, have, been, have been transported two or three hundred years ago. So it's quite hard, but let's put some numbers there. This paper tells us that there are 90 alien species have been identified um, in, in marine and brackish waters in, in, in Britain. So 90 sounds a decent number. Um, it also tells us that 58 of these are now established. Essentially what that means is that they, they are um, breeding populations and they are self-maintaining. So they, they're, they're here to stay, 58 species. Probably, probably the reality is far more than that. We just don't know about it. Um, but let's focus on, the, on, the, on that number and think um, about, well, first of all, about impact. Um, we talked about invasive species. So of those 58 that are established, I'll probably say that not all of those are invasive. Not all of those we would be able to show that there's actually an impact. When we think about the impact of invasive species um, on our environment, I'm not going to talk much about this, but essentially um, there's a quote here from the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. Biological invasions are generally accepted to be one of the greatest threats to biodiversity worldwide. Why, why, why would that be? Well, essentially, when you move something, um, a species, um, from one, one part of the planet to the other, you may well put it in an environment where it has no natural competitors, it has no natural predators, and it proliferates and outcompetes or eats native fauna and flora. Um, and for a variety of reasons, it can have huge economic and social impacts. So let's take an example. I, I'm just making one up. Let's say that um, a, a non-native uh, seaweed arrives, proliferates, and suddenly your beaches are covered in green gunk that wasn't there before. That has a huge economic impact. Whether you view these figures as high or not, I'm not sure, but essentially marine non-natives are estimated to have a direct cost to marine industries of about £40 million per year. So we could look at that further, but I'm, but I'm going to move away from, from impacts in my talk. Um, and in my talk, I'll, I'll mention a few um, locally important non-native species. So this is, this is, I guess that's the, the figure that uh, David objected to. Um, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't actually realise that, that it might look a bit dodgy. Um, um, <laughs> Until so actually my, part, my partner did point it out to me when she saw the poster. Um, anyway, so here we have um, a, gastro, a gastropod mollusk um, called Crepidula fornicata, um, which <coughs> is very common on the south coast of, of, of England. Unbelievably common. In fact, I've got pictures of some beaches uh, in, in, around the Solent area where the beach is solely made up of dead shells of Crepidula fornicata. Um, uh, why, why is it important here? Well, actually, it was introduced to the Menai Strait um, probably about 10 years ago um, uh, by mistake. Um, and uh, it's actually probably one of the, one, only one example where either by, by luck or by judgment, we have managed to get rid of a non-native species in the marine, marine environment. Um, so I got some muticum might be familiar to some of you. If you go out onto the rocky shore and go on to look at rock pools um, in this area, or certainly in, on Anglesey and further south, um, you'll certainly find a lot of rock pools are covered in this brown, um, large, canopy-forming um, seaweed. And that can have potential impact on, on local, local diversity in those rock pools. This thing looks a bit strange. I'll talk about it more later. It's a, it's a colonial tunicate. Strange word. Um, I'll come back to that later. Um, Didemnum vexillum. Let's talk about it later. Okay. So what will I talk about? I'm going to talk about a little, try and touch a little bit on ecology, um, and also then move into um, management. So, in terms of ecology, we could say, well, let's try and understand <coughs> what determines the success or failure of non-native invasion. Why? Why sometimes do um, some introduced species proliferate and kind of take over and potentially have uh, economic and social impacts and impacts on local biodiversity. 
And I'll look mainly at the, well, actually solely at one of these um, um, uh, parts of, the, of here, characteristics of the invader. So is, it, is there something about certain non-natives that makes them very prone to invasion? Um, a lot of work I've done also is looking at the characteristics of the native community. Are some, are some communities, are some ecosystems more invadable than others? Um, I cut that when I realised that I was probably going to run out of time. Um, I'll then move on to look at the management of marine aliens and try and think, well, is it possible to eradicate species when they arrive um, from another part of the planet? Um, and if not, well, maybe we need to look at managing the actual vectors the transport processes that move things around. Okay, so first of all, uh, a little bit, a little bit of um, kind of uh, playing around in the lab. So my, my screen goes red when I say that. This now should be red, but there we are. Doesn't matter. Characteristics of the of the invader. <clears throat> so here's a piece of work um, I did with colleagues in a project called Game. You might not be able to read that. Global approach by modular experiments. And as, as ecologists, we're always wanting to address big questions. And sometimes our local experiments um, kind of feel, well, local. We want to generalize across large regions, or in this case, across, across the planet. Here, we were asking a question, does stress tolerance differ between native and invasive species? So is that a mechanism by which certain species be can become very successful invaders, essentially because they can tolerate a whole range of different stresses and therefore grow and survive and do very well? Um, so we did this work, and I'll describe the work we did in Wales, but we, as part of this network, we also conducted the same experiment at, I think, eight or nine other locations around the world. And I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. <coughs> Okay, so we're returning to this guy, Didemnum vexillum, um, and this guy, Diplosoma listerianum. These were our, our model organisms, the things we, we focused our work on um, in the lab in North Wales. They are both colonial ascidians. We can use the term um, tunicates, um, or we can use the term, more common term, sea squirts. Sounds a bit more accessible. Sea squirts because some of these guys, not these ones, but some of them are quite big. When you squeeze them, they squirt water out of them. Um, and colonial ascidians belong to the phylum chordata. So in terms of biological organization, we belong to the phylum chordata. Um, so these guys, you wouldn't believe it, but are somehow, somehow related to us. The phylum chordata are characterized by having a backbone. So essentially, all chordates have a backbone. I hear you shout out, but these guys don't look like they've got backbones. Um, and this is where uh, a bit of complex taxonomy comes in, or complex biology. So the, the, the larval forms of ascidians, um, uh, which are the, essentially the, the, the juveniles of these guys, um, have something called a notochord, which is thought to be the precursor to development or evolution of the backbone. So, uh, they, both these animals are colonial, which means what we're looking at there, and, and there, it's easy to see here, um, are, is, is a colony which is made up of hundreds and thousands of individual animals that live together, and they need to live together in a colony. Other colonial organisms that you be more familiar with would be you know, often corals, coral reefs. And both of these animals live um, on, uh, in shallow water, living on hard substrata. This one is, is invasive. This one is a closely related species, but happens to be native. So we're comparing the stress tolerance in a native species and an invasive species. And in terms of thinking about stresses in coastal habitats, um, we can think of, well, living on the coast can be quite stressful. If you live intertidally, you'll be very often desiccated. Um, in shallow water and intertidally, you'll undergo temperature fluctuations, sometimes oxygen depletion. Um, what we fo focused on was, as a stressor was fluctuations in salinity. 
And that's a good one because with uh, global warming, we don't just expect warming, we expect more extreme weather. With extreme weather comes storms, with storms comes high precipitation, uh, which runs off into the coastal areas. So we get changes in salinity in coastal areas from fully marine and suddenly bang, a big rainfall and we get a massive reduction in salinity. So you think that animals that can, co can cope with that may well do better. Okay, so how do we undertake these experiments? We take something that looks like that, that's some, some colonial ascidian actually growing on, on, a, on, a, on a rope that we've extracted from, the, from, a, from a marina. Um, and we want to take a, a sample of that. We take a thin, thin slice of that animal, that colony, and settle it out onto a glass slide. Um, so various techniques to do that. But we then get a colony living on a glass slide that we can use in, our, in the lab. We can suspend those glass slides in um, uh, plastic containers, uh, feed those animals what they like to feed on. They are filter feeders, they feed on uh, phytoplankton. And you can see we can keep lots of them. So we've got a nice experimental system. This is, this is in the, the lab at, uh, at the School of Ocean Sciences in Menai Bridge. Um, <coughs> We have to be careful. Um, here we're transporting um, a non-native species into the lab, um, which actually, this, I'll come to this later, doesn't exist in the Menai Strait, and we don't really want to spill lots of water into the drains and introduce it to the Menai Strait. So there's lots of quarantine processes going on to work with these uh, ascidians. And a simple experiment here, we've got our native and non-native, and we expose it to different levels of salinity and then look at the response in terms of um, oxygen consumption, so respiration, and long-term responses more in terms of growth and survival. Thinking, thinking or hypothesizing that our non-native will be more stress tolerant to these um, changes in, changes in, sal in salinity. <coughs> okay, some results, there's lots of results, a few, a few here. Um, when we expose the animals to constant stress, so low levels of salinity. I think this graph is from 27 PSU, which PSU stands for practical salinity units. Um, normal seawater is about 35, so we give it much lower salinity. And this line here is our uh, um, uh, invasive species. It copes fine for about nine days um, living at that low salinity and starts to decline. But you can see that our native immediately starts to die. Sorry, big pardon, this is survival. So in terms of survival, our native can't cope, our non-native can. When we give pulse levels of stress, we give a stress event here, and here, and here, and here, in terms of actual pure water. So pure, um, fresh water for two hours, then back into fully marine. And you can see our non-native copes fine, our native species starts to die immediately. In terms of growth, that says um, 34 PSU, 27, 20. So at natural salinity levels, our non-native grows quickly. It's a strong competitor. Our native, slow growing, but fine. But we lower the salinity and we see growth only in our non-native species. So coming back to that question, does stress tolerance differ between native and invasive species? It seems for our, from our single example in North Wales, yes, it does. Our non-native is much more stress tolerant, which might indicate why, in general terms, non-natives can proliferate. But the strength of our conclusions is much stronger if we can ask the question across the globe. And if we ask that question, well, we get this answer. This is a, a paper we wrote from this work. Non-native marine invertebrates are more tolerant towards environmental stress than taxonomically related native species. So I think in eight out of 10 of those comparisons, the non-native species coped far better with stress than the native species. So it seems and there's a variety of mechanisms which might mean that your non-native is more stress tolerant. It could be that um, it's simply um, 
that species happens to be more stress tolerant, that's why it's managed to be a non-native. Um, it could be that actually in its native environment, that particular species before it's transported, essentially is the same in terms of stress tolerance, but the, the actual process of transportation in itself is quite stressful. So you will select from all those individuals, the most stress tolerant individuals, they're the only ones who'll survive once they've transported across the globe. So the genotype of that introduced species has been essentially selected for to be stress tolerant, and that's the one that arrives and then proliferates. So a little taste of the kinds of research that we might do to look at um, uh, invasion. I was going to look a little bit about um, what, what it means, why, why do some communities, why are some communities invaded and some not? Um, and the, the, one of the general theories out there is that diverse communities with lots of native species might be more um, resilient to invasion than less diverse uh, communities. More diverse communities um, use resources far more effectively such that an invader has nothing to live on. I won't go further with that because we don't have time. I'm going to move on to management and talk a little bit about er eradication attempts and uh, management of vectors. So a lot of the work that I've done over the past few years on non-natives has been in marinas, coastal marinas. And marinas, we know, all around the world, are hotspots for non-native species. Why would that be the case? Well, marinas, by their very nature, um, are sheltered. We create shelter for, for the boats that uh, occupy the marina. They're a sheltered subtidal habitat. Because they're enclosed, they have what we might call a high propagule pressure. So a species arriving, let's say, in that marina, let's say on the bottom of a, a yacht, might reproduce. And in an open marine environment, those, the larvae, the planktonic juveniles of that species, will be dispersed. But here, we've got an enclosed environment where all those larvae I've got a nice place to settle, and there's lots of them. So we've got a high propagule pressure. Also, recreational vessels, like yachts, um, can tend, because they're not commercial vessels, to be more poorly maintained than large tankers, commercial vessels that go into ports, etc. So anti-fouling may be lacking, which leads to um, fouling. And you can see you know, that's a, the hull of a vessel covered in marine life. Here is another one. This, this actually vessel is from Holyhead Marina, um, with, and actually that's Didemnum vexillum. We've come across that growing off the stern end of the vessel. Um, and, and a study there, coastal transport hubs in New Zealand were far more likely to become infected than quieter locations. So basically, the amount of traffic, the amount of boats passing through a marina will determine the amount of non-natives. So there's lots of clues there that tells us that recreational vessels, mainly yachts, hull fouling, fouling essentially mean, meaning animals growing, animals and plants growing on the hull, um, is an important vector. So back to our colonial ascidian, Didemnum vexillum. Um, this is an invasive species worldwide. Invasive, so it causes problems worldwide. It, it um, grows quickly. It can smother native fauna. And in terms of economic impact, in various parts of the world, it's been shown to be a, a big nuisance on aquaculture facilities. You can see there um, some uh, <coughs> aquaculture installation, probably for growing something like uh, oysters or scallops. Um, it even grows in high densities in large parts of the Grand Banks of North America. I think both of these pictures are um, of Didemnum vexillum locally. Locally meaning Holyhead Marina. Well, yeah, in the past, as you probably imagine. Um, so Didemnum, Didemnum vexillum arrived in Europe, I think, in about 1991 in the Netherlands. Since then, it's spread around, but for a long time, it wasn't present in the British Isles. It got into Ireland. And then we, 
scientists often use the term we. Um, that means that, you know, actually I had nothing to do with it. I mean, it was somebody else doing the hard work, but I was vaguely associated with it. Um, my, my master student, uh, Kate, um, was looking at marinas uh, in North Wales, and she found what looked like a very strange organism, looked into it, it turned out to be Didemnum vexillum. So in Holyhead, Kate found the first record of this animal in Britain. Um, there's a paper there that she wrote about it. <coughs> and this caused alarm bells to ring um, with what was then CCW, Countryside Council for Wales, which is now NRW, Natural Resources Wales, because it was the first record of what is known as a global pest. And because of the location next to the Menai Strait, which is home to the UK's largest blue mussel fishery. And we know from other parts of the world that rapid growth of this organism, smothering native fauna, can potentially have large impacts. So what that led to was a, a rapid response group being formed, um, which involved um, scientists like myself, people from, from CCW, the Countryside Council for Wales, people from DEFRA, um, people from SNH in Scotland, all coming together to say, well, wh wh what should we do about this? So it, it was of sufficient concern that conservation bodies throughout the UK came together to say, should we try and do something? <coughs> so we've got a timeline now, shows it's important. Um, in 2008, Kate made the discovery. Um, that led to us, us reporting uh, the work to uh, CCW. A dive survey showed that um, Didemnum vexillum, which had been found on the pontoons of the marina in Holyhead, was only present on the pontoons in the marina. It wasn't part of the uh, wider harbour environment. So it was only on, only on artificial structures. Um, a survey was then und undertaken throughout Wales. Was it in, in other marinas in Wales? No. And a report was commissioned about seven, eight months later, um, which recommended rapid action. Whether you perceive eight months later as rapid action, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, and that rapid action meant that, okay, we think we'll try and eradicate this species. It's the only record in, uh, in Britain. It's only in a tiny area, only living on artificial structures in the marina. So over this period here, 2009, 2010, autumn through to springtime was an eradication attempt of Didemnum vexillum. And my work and colleagues at Ocean Sciences' involvement in this was trying to give some scientific background, some ecology, um, to inform that eradication attempt. Um, so I said these things. The justification to try this was it was limited here. There was a problem with the mussel fishery, and I guess probably um, EU legislation and the threat of EU litigation um, probably prompted some of this activity. Um, and the attempt was 14 months after we discovered it. This is through the Rapid Action Response Group. Now, who laughed? <laughs> so, uh, this is the marina. So I mentioned a small area, but we've still got 530 pontoon units, 125 chains anchoring the pontoons to the seabed, and also a variety of moorings and, and actual contaminated vessels. So it still wasn't a small, a trivial uh, matter. Um, fortunately, attempts have been made in the past in New Zealand um, to uh, do the same thing we were trying to do, eradicate this Acidian from a marina environment. So the work was based on the work in New Zealand and it involved enclosing all these pontoon surfaces underwater in heavy duty PVC bag bags or wrapping. By enclosing, and you can, you can see that here, here are all the pontoons, here are all the floats that have been enclosed in PVC. By enclosing um, the, the pontoons in PVC, you basically create an anoxic environment. There's no oxygen there, because it's all used up and not replenished, and essentially organisms will die. Because this, this, was, this was occurring over the cold winter period, to, to um, accelerate that, uh, 
calcium hypochlorite was added, which is essentially bleach, um, to kill everything living on all the marina structures. Uh, even then, it sounds quite simple, but there were 14 different designs of pontoon floats, and all those had to be, all these bags, which are quite significantly large, had to be designed for all those different sizes of pontoons. If you imagine we have pontoons here, they're attached to the seabed by these chains, so we've got all this complexity here, which are, all these bags have to be, be, be designed to wrap around all these complex areas. And you can see there, um, we've got a typical British winter, um, which uh, uh, makes things a lot more difficult. Here's a video um, showing the um, uh, underwater pontoon with the PVC bags, the, the bespoke designed bags. Some of these bags were very large with floating structures here that have been pumped up. And here's the structure that will go under the pontoon and around it. We've got all these chains that are essentially all wrapped in polythene. And obviously this involves a lot of diving. And um, maybe this was a foretaste of things to come with, with Holyhead, Holyhead Marina, which many of you will know doesn't exist anymore because it was destroyed in storms last year. We can see um, that conditions are quite challenging for diving. Um, this was produced, this video produced during the process. So progress was good when the conditions were good. You might not be able to see there, but there's ice now on the surface of the water. Um, a lot of students from Ocean Sciences got casual labour, in, um, uh, casual employment working on this. Now, you, you enclose these uh, pontoons, leave it for a week or so, potentially add bleach, and everything dies. So we can kill things, relatively simply. <coughs> so you can see there... Uh, lots of fouling organisms, a whole range of bryozoans, ascidians, barnacles, mussels being killed. Ooh, I thought, ooh, okay. Um, you think, therefore, okay, Didendum vexillum was only present on those pontoons, we'll kill it all, job done. Well, I guess because you saw a long timeline, maybe not. So, that was the eradication attempt. All the pontoons were enclosed all looked like that last video in the end. Unfortunately, about six months later, surveys showed the eradication was not successful. Colonies of Didendum vexillum were still present on, on some, some pontoons. A whole range of reasons why that is the case, but it was decided that sufficient progress had been made to make a second eradication attempt. Same procedure, unfortunately, Small colony is still present, more retreatment, and by 2013, more surveys showed that colony is still detected in multiple locations. And this, I mean, some of you might have seen this, this got a lot of, a lot of media attention. Um, uh, colleagues at NRW ended up on the One Show, um, and it cost a few quid. So over the four year period, almost a million pounds spent on trying to eradicate. Um, this species from Holyhead Marina. In terms of why it failed, it's actually bloody difficult um, to simultaneously enclose all pontoons at the same time. Um, resources were not such that that could be done with a sufficient manpower, so it was done in a staged process, and probably what happened and this is informed by some research we did, is that um, uh, pontoons were, 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 were treated, bags taken off, but there were still pontoons that had diademium vexillum that were reproducing, which then, recruit, which then produced um, larvae, which recruited onto these pontoons that had then been cleared. Lovely bare settlement area for this new larvae to settle on. Um, so probably resources ultimately were the, were the limiting factor. <coughs> Moving on, um, so, eradication of marine invaders is unbelievably difficult. If we have time at the end, I'll show some slides um, which show in which parts of the world we have been successful. Why is it hard in the marine environment? Essentially, the marine environment is a massively open system. So, everything is interconnected. 
and the majority of marine animals and plants um, have a pelagic phase in their life cycle. A phase in their life cycle where either larvae or spores move around in the, in the oceans with, with, with um, ocean currents and can move large distances. So everything's interconnected. So if you get an invader so in one place, it will very rapidly move to another and to another to another. Far more so than in the terrestrial environment or in perhaps lakes in a, in a fresh, freshwater environment. So eradication is unbelievably difficult. Um, on reflection, should we, should NRW have bothered? Well, yes, I think so. Um, uh, we learned a lot from that process. During that process, it became apparent that uh, Didum and Vexillum had arrived at other locations in the UK. Um, and now, or Britain, I should say, and now there's probably about five or six locations around Britain where we have Didemnum vexillum. So in, in a way, the window of opportunity to prevent this invader from arriving in Britain ha has, has gone. So vectors are what uh, transport non-natives around. Um, vectors in the marine environment um, involve ballast water. So lots of um, trans, um, well, across oceans shipping involves large vessels that have ballast water in them um, and that ballast water is taken in in one part of the world and very often removed or, or, or released in another part of the world. So we get um, organisms living in that ballast water that are transported in, uh, in that way. Hull fouling, whether of large commercial vessels or of yachts. <clears throat> Movement of aquaculture products is another one. We move things around a lot and living with the aquaculture products, the, the, the oysters, for example, will be countless other animals living in, um, in amongst and also within in terms of pests and diseases. So managing vectors really is where we need to probably focus our efforts. As I said, I've, I've been focusing on marinas and recreational boating um, and we're 99% sure that Dadden and Vexelum is moving around Europe. It might have arrived in Europe from, sorry, I should have mentioned, from the Pacific um, via some other means, but it, it's moving around Europe probably um, as, as, as growing on the bottom of vessels like these. You know, we get things like this showing movements around the Irish Sea of vessels, of, of yachts between various marinas. So, a few years ago, we started thinking with colleagues, again at NRW, um, are, there, are, there, are there ways that we could manage, um, uh, uh, manage the movement or manage the transfer of organisms from the fouled hull into our marinas um, in some kind of way? So we came up with this idea, um, developing biosecurity measures and managing risk through an in-water encapsulation system. Um, we've got a little dinghy here, which is sitting in our much larger uh, in-water encapsulation system. We also refer to this as our quar quarantine berth. <clears throat> the idea is that um, uh, a, a yacht might arrive from, um, let's say, let's, let's focus on Holyhead. So it arrives in Holyhead from Ireland, from an area where we know that a certain non-native non -native species um, is abundant or is present. So that yacht presents a risk. Now, taking the yacht out of the water, um, uh, uh, pressure cleaning it, making sure that all the stuff that comes off it doesn't go back into the water, it's quite a laborious and time-intensive process. Our focus here was on producing some kind of uh, mechanism whereby we could um, uh, provide some kind of quarantine system and clean the hull while it's in the water over about a 15, 20 minute period. So the idea is um, that a yacht drives into this floating structure. And you can just about see there, hopefully, there's uh, basically um, a structure in the water um, which looks like that. So we drive in here into this structure. It's enclosed there. We zip up the back of the structure here. We've now enclosed and isolated the vessel. Um, here you can see it in the quarantine berth. And on the side here, we've got a set of pumping, a pumping system which pumps the water out of this area, so out of the quarantine berth into the, into the sea. 
and then it pumps a, a dilute chemical, essentially a di very dilute bleach, into this system here. And that dilute bleach essentially kills all any animals or plants living on the hull of the vessel. Leave it for an appropriate amount of time, probably five or ten minutes. Pump the chemical back into our holding tank. Pump the seawater back into here and the vessel drives out. That was our uh, process. We produced that with funding from, uh, from NRW. Um, we, we, we looked in the lab and we showed that, yes, we can kill didemnum vexillum when we expose it to uh, either 1% bleach, 5% vinegar. We showed that we could operate that quarantine berth quickly and effectively. It would take some marina staff probably 20 minutes to drive the vessel in, go through that process and drive it out. But, there's always a but, um, the pumping system was actually quite difficult, complex, prone to breaking down. Um, <coughs> we wanted to minimise chemical use, but also maximise exposure to the organs living on the hull. That caused problems as well. And actually we moved forward from this towards a system using ozone. So rather than using a, chemical, a liquid chemical, we were bubbling ozone within that um, enclosed system. Um, and ozone is used in, in, in various um, operations, in uh, swimming pools, in uh, aquaculture, um, even sometimes in ballast water to sterilize, and, well, to sterilize. We used ozone, again, we came across practical problems, um, such that at the moment, we've kind of parked this idea. So, eradication failed. Uh, management of vectors through this particular process, mm, not quite sure. Let's end on a, end on a positive. Um, so, I'm now involved in a, a large European funded project called EcoStructure, Climate Change Adaptation Through Ecologically Sensitive Coastal Infrastructure. Um, and as part of that, that project, which is a across Wales and Ireland, um, uh, I persuaded colleagues that um, a lot of this project focuses on artificial sea defences. I persuaded them that uh, ports and marinas are artificial structures that are proliferating, potentially causing problems. Um, so I introduced a non-native component into this project um, and we took a step back. We said, well, okay, we've been kind of uh, messing around with trying to look at, in our case, our quarantine berth. Um, but actually, what we're realising many times is that we, we, we need to engage with the people. Scientists sometimes operate in a vacuum. We need to engage with, in this case, uh, marina owners, marina operators. Um, so some work we've been doing as part of this larger project is exploring the perception of marine biosecurity interventions and gaining insight from the commercial marina sector. So a really successful thing we've done recently is organise a, a workshop, so a marina and biosecurity workshop, um, understanding the sector's priorities for non-native species biosecurity. So we gathered a number of marina owners and operators from Wales and Ireland together in Bangor. Um, we had uh, lots of post-it note stuff going on, but essentially lots of discussion and, and, and downloading their experience and their attitude to non-natives. A lot of positives came out of that. Um, I perceived that uh, scientists meddling or government meddling in marina, marine, marina operations would be perceived quite negatively by marina owners. Actually, they, um, they recognise their customer base. Their customer base are um, people who love the, the environment, um, people who enjoy being out in the marine environment, and those people have concerns. So if those marina owners can show that they are um, uh, running an environmentally friendly operation, that's a positive. So actually a lot of the barriers that I thought were in place to, um, uh, to um, undertaking biosecurity interventions, which might mean things like inconveniencing yacht owners by, for example, n um, a register of where they've come from, where they're going to, what their record of anti-fouling is, um, whether they would actually take part in something like the quarantine birth willingly or whether actually no way you have to pay me to do that. So at the moment we're kind of taking a step back and our quarantine birth is parked literally in the, in the car park of ocean sciences um, but other ideas whether it be trying to look at behaviour change or other 
novel interventions um, are where we're going with um, our work at the moment. I think that's my last slide. Okay, so thank you very much for coming, and if you've got questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. <laughs>